Hey guys, I'm here with Derek Olson of Megalithic Marvels. He's a content creator across all platforms. Like you, I guess you would call, would you call yourself like a, you're not really a YouTuber because you're also like an Instagrammer slash a Twitter. -er. You're like, he's like, kind of try to do it all. Yeah. He's like the ultimate social media megalithic man. It's yeah. I love it. I'll take that title. Yeah. I'm kind of a, yeah, not just YouTube, um, but yeah, Instagram, I think, is where I started. So that's kind of got a place in my heart, even though they've kind of been uh, shadow banning me recently. That's kind of hurt my feelings a little bit. But So when you say they shadow ban you, like, to what level? Like, like if you, cause, so like normally, like a year ago, if you would have posted some, like, whatever, like an Indonesia megalith, like how many yeah. views would you have instantly gotten? Well, it's weird. It's... Maybe shadow banning is not the right um, word, but I've noticed just from tracking my growth stats, I'll still get a, you know, a lot of views for reels and stuff, but um, it's like my channel quit growing at, I think, 334,000 when I was, you know, growing easily a couple thousand a month and now I'm stuck at 334. So it's like, Hey, what's going on? And then I started to get messages from people saying, Hey, um, I heard you on such and such a show. Um, so I was able to somehow find you, but just to let you know, I, you're not in the search results anywhere. So I tried it myself and sure enough, at least as of this recording, if you type in megalithic marvels, um, nothing pops up, no accounts, no hashtags. And it's been like that for a couple months. And so, um, that there's, that's the correlation, I think, right? Nobody well, can find me. I think me. you need to just be flattered because it means you're over the target. That's what it means. I, I guess that's the silver lining, right? We're getting, we're getting over the target of the uh, cover up of ancient history. Yes. Okay. So let's just get juicy right off the bat. Okay. So give me as of today, because I know we're evolving creatures that change based on whatever information we're given, but as of today, where does Derek Olson, if I, if I was like elevator pitch, tell me what you think is going on with reality and history and like what's up with all the stuff that why do we see these crazy things that are not talked about in mainstream at all wow great question right off the bat um i mean i i guess i would say look at this massive effort that we see by the mainstream media and the the powers that be right just to feed us this daily diet of what we would call fake news and so if they'll go to that length, um, if the powers that be will work that hard every day to hide today's real news from us, what lengths do we think they'll go to hide our real history from us? Um, and I think that's that's what's been going on because those who control the past control the future. And so they strategically, um, I believe there's this, I hate to use the word they, but it seems like they strategically disinform us regarding the prehistoric past. And then it's like they turn it around and accuse us or a guy like Graham Hancock of spreading disinformation. Right. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think almost all of us were brought up to believe at least from what we learned in school that um, ancient times equal primitive times. Right. But as you know, as you've been digging into history for a while now, the further we look back into history, um, when you go to Egypt, you can see actually the more advanced they were. And coming fresh off of my last Egypt tour in May, I mean, I think I came back from this trip with even, I should have more answers, but I almost have more questions. Like I was so blown away at the evidence of lost ancient technology uh, we were seeing. And as you know, again, the mainstream tells us that the uh, the pharaonic dynasties, um, the pharaohs, as awesome as they were, the d dynastic Egyptians were this brilliant, amazing, incredible culture who emerged around 3000 BC, but they get all the credit, right, for building and constructing all of the uh, pyramids and these megalithic temples in Egypt. And we're told that they constructed the pyramids as tombs, right? Um, but when you're in Egypt on the ground and you go to the Valley of the Kings, which is, I believe, over 500 miles away from the Great Pyramid, you realize the inside of the pyramids in Giza is completely different, as you know, from what you see inside the Valley of the Kings, right? They don't match 
how could these be both be built by the same uh, people in one you have bare megalithic walls no art no hieroglyphs no depictions in the valley of the kings 500 miles away you see the art depictions and you see the hieroglyphs and Everything. yeah and so you go okay well, what's going on here these the first thing you realize is okay this is a world away the valley of the kings from the great pyramid and it looks completely different inside than the great pyramid right so you kind of start connecting the dots and to me um there's definitely this 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 cover up of history. So I know I said a lot there. Um, well, I mean, I agree with you, and I think for for me, I I've also been you know doing this like I mean I've had this podcast for over four years, and um, you know you would think that after a while you would be like yeah I get it now I get it. like what's going on no I know less than when I started because uh, every new mystery you're just kind of going. Uh, uh, what, what it, it, it is, they just compound on each other. And then you get corroborated for me. My big thing is like that I look into a lot and I've been compiling and who knows what I'll do with it every, but, but, um, like I got this big database kind of growing and stuff, but it's the hallmarks that connect everything. So for example, if it doesn't matter if you were building in Japan or Texas or Argentina, you're still going to have places that use concrete. We use nails, we use screws, we use wood. You know, we have like, we have a, we may be having different architectural styles, but everywhere in the world has an, you know, a construction language. And there is a construction language that has a little bit, you're going to find a little bit different nubs and megaliths in Peru than you are in Egypt or, or Greece or Easter Island or whatever, China, but there's some commonalities. And the fact that there's commonalities within these giant megalithic stones is like, excuse me, what, what, why are we not talking about this? Like, why do we find scrape marks and cut marks and the, the polygonal or Polag whatever polygonals like <laughs> you know the seismic like yep. puzzle piece tetrising together like why do we find the size of these things like why do we find the kind of andesite or the kind of stones or like these limestones that you're kind of going like I, I don't even know where he found this this is like a mate why do we find the commonalities of this everywhere on the planet and then don't right. talk about it it's weird it's insane yeah the these uh, our tour guide in Egypt is Mohammed Ibrahim, who's not just a tour guide, as you know, he's a uh, very uh, well-studied Egyptologist and one of the only ones I know of that's broken with the mainstream and is brave enough and bold enough to say somebody else built the pyramids before the, the dynasty Egyptians. Um, so he likes to use the word now called pre-Diluvian ancient Egyptians. He uses that word pre-Diluvian to... Uh, you know, show that he's not talking about the dynastic Egyptians. So when he's talking about pre-Diluvian, he's talking about pre-flood or these golden age ancient Egyptians, what he would say the original ones. And so, and I can get more into this, but you go to Egypt, you see the pyramids, you go inside, you see these ancient megalithic temples, which same builders, different functionality where the pyramid is not like functional for a, a human like person to be climbing through the temples. You can tell we're built for these fertility and healing purposes. And so these ancient Egyptians had this high order of astronomical knowledge. I mean, you go into Dendera temple and you're seeing, you know, the cosmos depicted it's mind blowing. And so they had this profound knowledge uh, they knew about universal harmonic rhythmic laws. They had mathematical and scientific knowledge, and it was embedded in the temples, right? Symbolically. Yeah, and like so that one it, temple next. To, I love, I don't know what it is, like Muhammad calls it, because I also did the Muhammad tour in 2019. Yep. So, like, he, we did the, um, what is it? I think he called it the hospital. I can't remember what the official name is. The one that's right next near to Near Saqqara, yep. In Saqqara, yep. yeah. And there's still there. I think originally there may have been twelve boxes or whatever yes. you call them, like chambers. But now there's five. But every time you stick your head in one, it's it's not like a woo woo, like a funny, like oh Nikki mm -hmm. hears a noise. No, it's like a microphone can hear a noise. Like anybody can hear a noise. It's <laughs> they have like a resonance coming off of them, and apparently they'll say, oh, it's because there's water running down. 
they all sound different and they're crazy and they're there and I'm gonna go into this thing see if you can hear this little it starts humming humanly I can hear it right now can you hear that when you go into these boxes it's like a hum Why is that still working and what is that and they built that intentionally there's like some intention that has you know some functionality still going it's crazy to me and i no, never wanted that ever until i actually was at the place you're, you're exactly right that is a, a perfect example today in the year 2023 you can still go experience some of this you know what i would call evidence of lost ancient tech right there near the step pyramid in what's kind of known as the hospital. Um, basically, this was an ancient prehistoric healing center. But like you said, there's these five different chambers. You go through like this mez this la labyrinth-like maze, and you stick your head inside this enclosure, trapezoidal, that tapers in, and you can literally... It was so fun to watch the members of our tour experience this who have never been around anything like this. Their minds were blown um so that was cool have you nikki heard about um egypt's area 51 no tell us so unfortunately you can't see this uh at least as far as i know in a public tour but this was something i learned about in the last year that just has got me and i want to do do some more research and i can send you pictures on any anything i'm okay, saying cool. i can add it in yeah, but um, so like about three miles from Giza, the pyramids, there's this site called, I think it's Zau, Zauyet El Arian, if I'm pronouncing that right. And uh, according to Muhammad, it's known by insiders as Egypt's Area 51. And that is because since um, like the early 1960s, the Egyptian military seized control of the site. And so it's become off limits to tourism. And even archaeologists, as far as I know, can't just go and study there. It's or they have to get super high, uh, high level permission. And so the only photos we really have of this site were taken um, from the original Italian archaeologist who excavated it in 1904. And it's one of these sites that's inverted. So it was like, whatever was over the top of it, whether it was a pyramid is gone. And so you're just going to this massive chambers into the earth. So it's subterranean inverted. It's cut, cut deep into this limestone. Oh, is this the one that has the big, like almost the box lids with nubs on it too? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So in one of these um, enclosures, um, it's like this massive T shape into the ground. There's these three separate chambers and these old photos they're just so nostalgic, you know, like early 1900s. So it almost looks like this could be, you know, a lot of these fake AI photos we're seeing people make of Antarctica and machines. Right. Um, not that I don't believe there was crazy stuff in Antarctica. Um, but these are real photos. And yes, you see these massive granite blocks and this oval shaped uh, granite cylindrical lid right with these massive nubs on it protruding out of it and um the coolest thing about this is according to muhammad um when you read the archaeologist writings on this he found the title saba in one of the blocks at this site and saba is uh translated stargate so pretty unique mysterious site there for people to check out i actually did a video on it one time but um Egypt's Area 51, it's right there. Okay, cool. I would have to look more into that too. I mean, when you start looking at um, like Google Earth of Egypt, uh, I, the, I I feel like we've we've barely touched the surface. I mean, we barely touched the surface of, of Egypt and we're just, just kind of getting like a little bit of what they're, we're allowed to get. Even like the Os Osirian, right? Like when you, that was like a lot of these things have only been kind of uncovered within the last hundred years. And when you go to the Osirian, which uh, there's only a little portion they allow you to, to actually go into, but there's more to it. And like, who knows like how far and how reaching that is. They've only really dug up that one part. We don't know what's to the left or to the right of it. 
or at least maybe somebody does, but you and I don't get to know. Well, actually, I'm glad you brought that up. That was probably the, the, one of my favorite parts of our last trip, because guess what? We got a private tour inside the Osirion. So we got to go down inside um, and, you know, walk where you see the water, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the green waters which come up. And, um, I mean, we weren't able to go into every entrance, but, I mean, I went as far as I could on one side, um, which kind of ends with this gate. And then Muhammad took us into the one area that they've recently opened up. Oh, I got up. to go into that one, too. the one that uh, is in the... The front part of it where there's is it got newt a big thing and newt on the ceiling yes it stinks like really bad in there it's horrible it's, yeah it's often flooded yeah but i mean it was amazing to go down inside and just see the scale of these <laughs> these blocks right i mean and for me the thing about the osirin that's one of the it looks so similar to peru like right you know, I don't know what they, they, they were related in some kind of way that was, I don't know, because like if you go take, I don't know, Machu Picchu or Saxy Woman and you compare that to Osiren, they're not that dissimilar. They really aren't in a lot of their, um, their construction type is crazy, but even, even, but like, okay, when you go, there's another part that you can go that, um, so like there's a part with the newt and then you can go walk further in the Osiris and you can go left or right, but they have mm. it closed off at some point. You don't know how, how much further it does go. Then right. like when you look at it on Google earth, it's, it's unburied, but we, they didn't like cover the outsides of the walls or anything. So we don't know how, or we don't, we really don't know how far this goes. Yeah, no, it, you're right. We don't. And I don't think anybody, or at least unless you're, an Egyptologist on the inside can can uh, see all of this, but I you probably heard Muhammad's theory that so you've got the the pyramids that were likely producing some type of holistic energy, and those pyramids powered the megalithic temples uh, like the Valley Temple right next to the Sphinx, which is clearly above ground and was used for healing purposes. But then he believes that like this Osirian of Abydos was likely maybe an engine that was powering the actual pyramids and it's underground. And that's why you can see what almost looks like explosive marks, you know, from explosive explosions that were happening because this thing is uh, operating on such a powerful level. And so that's interesting um, that he thinks it might've been an, like an engine that was connected almost wirelessly um, using resonant energy through the ground. And so, and then there, he says there's guards everywhere that talk about huge, vast tunnels uh, under the ground, kind of like the tunnels when you're going into the Valley of the Kings. You know, they're just massive. Um, which, or like the big I, tunnels underneath the step pyramid that like I didn't get to exactly. go. Exactly. But they're just so like, what connects Just that? these massive tunnels that literally run all over Giza and are connecting uh even from Giza down to uh, Aswan, these sites. So crazy to consider. Um, And even like, just like the green algae that does come off of the Osirian, you're kind of going like, like when I was there, it was like lime green. It was like, uh, what kind of food are you guys getting down here in the desert? Because this <laughs> is amazing that you're, I mean, it's almost like they're reacting to some sort of, you know, resonance that's still coming off of something. But okay, so crazy story time from Nikki like and I've told this on my podcast before but and I didn't want this to happen to me it just happened to me but I when I got to go into the great pyramid I found myself alone in the king's chamber for like 10 minutes or something because the rest of the, like there was 20 of us on wow. my group, and so we had it for two hours and then some people were off seeing other things and so I walk in there, I'm alone and I'm like, okay, what do I do? I don't know how long I'm going to be alone. I know if I'm going to be alone for 30 seconds. I don't know if I'm going to be alone for who knows. So like I run over to the box, I jump into the box. There's no security guard. There's nothing in there. And uh, so I'm alone. I don't want to meditate because I don't want to close my eyes because I don't want to close my eyes when I'm in a place that you're not supposed to, or you'll never get to be in alone. Right. So I, this was not a part of my life plan that I was going to get to be alone in King's chamber. So I was like, okay, fine. So I just 
I had gone to like this crazy hippie like festival a month before in Taos and it was like a Native American thing and this like Colombian shaman guy told me a spell to open a portal and so I was like all and he kept on telling me you're gonna need this you need to remember this you need like he kept on telling me this spell and I was like okay little man like I don't know why I need a spell but okay fine sure whatever so then I lay down I'm looking up at the ceiling I start saying the spell and this apparition starts coming out of the granite it's like a okay it's it wow. looks like this it look like you could see the hat come out and like a little bit of the chin and then you know how they have those pointy egypt like skirts um yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah and then and then it like so basically it looks like this kind of thing it's starting to pop out of the granite on top of me and then I get scared because I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. I don't like, don't, sorry. I'm not, like, we're, I, I, I don't know. I don't want it to come out. And then some people start coming in and it just kind of like turns to smoke and goes away. And then I sit up and they're like, oh, you're the king's chamber alone. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. Huh. You're like, you have no idea what just happened. I was like, yeah. So I, as a human being alive right now, think about, like, I hear everybody's theory, how it's like a water pump and it's a this and it's a this. A, all these things and i'm like what i do know is that if you say a little colombian uh, spell you can get something to start forming out of granite i don't know what it is but i know the stars wow. date thing may not be that far off and do you was it coming out of like the ceiling down at you yeah that's crazy yeah because you know like uh the ceiling i don't know how many but there's it's like giant granite blocks that are like the size of the whole room and they yeah 70 the ton so it was the granite slab that was directly on top of where the box was is is what started to form i mean in it it looked like it was a humanoid in like a giant hat with like the pharaoh skirt thing coming out at me um and it was coming out in a profile and it yeah it, it hadn't formed yet it was forming and it was like made of it was made of what it was coming out of uh, to start so but when it disappeared it disappeared like you know and turned almost to a smoke and then and then the ceiling looked normal again and i was just like huh huh wow wow okay. yeah when i was in there you know i'm not the world's biggest like feeler like some people on our tour were like having some crazy experiences um at, at a couple of these sites and i you know i believed their story these weren't like these were very smart one one lady was a really brilliant doctor and had this really powerful experience where she just felt this energy to where she literally had to leave the site because it was you know so strong so i you know i kind of hear their stories and i'm like kind of a little bitter you know and um so when we had our private tour inside the great pyramid Kind of the same thing ha happened. Um, you know, I was, I better cut this story short. Anyway, we're inside there and I had asked Muhammad to kind of, can you kind of resonate this chamber for us? So he had everybody, you know, just lay down or sit down and just chill out, you know, don't take pictures. And so we're doing that and he starts doing his um and this thing's getting louder and louder. And uh, I thought, you know what? I'm going to like take my shoes off and just enjoy this experience, you know, do a little grounding here. And I'm just, you know, I'm just breathing, just trying to just chill out and looking up. And I could, I'll, I'll, the closest thing I can equate this to is having Novocaine at the dentist or the, the laughing gas. <laughs> Have you ever had that? Yeah. Like when I had uh, my wisdom teeth out, it's like, oh. Yeah, you know, you just you take that and you're breathing in and it just gives you this super chill. And that's what it felt like. Um, almost kind of like this blanket over you. I had never experienced anything like that, but I experienced it in the king's chamber. And so that was pretty wild. But then everybody kind of left to explore the other chambers, and it was pretty cool. I I got to go back up there all by myself. There was one guard in there, um, but he pretty much let me have the the rain of the place so that was cool see cool you got to do it too i mean like uh see guys if you go on one of his tours 
that's what's going to happen to you. Hey. Um, <laughs> yeah, I it, it makes it to where I kind of go, you can't completely disregard the woo with some of this stuff too. Like there's something going on that's like a, maybe a little bit, maybe it is material, material reductionist. Like maybe there is an actual science to it that's lost that we don't understand. But one way or the other, it is like there's some kind of, um, there's, there's some real mystery with these stones and these megalo. They weren't nothing. Yeah. If you haven't done it, well, let me say one thing and then I'll ask you something else. So if you believe that these pyramids were collecting like cosmic waves, right? Um, and I think you would agree with me, the dynastic Egyptians of 3000 BC repurposed these pyramids. Um, so I don't believe they were originally built as tombs. But I believe the dynastic Egyptians of 3000 BC probably used them as tombs um, because the these kings, these Egyptian kings, understood that this pyramid was basically this ancient generator of sorts amongst other functions. And they wanted to be buried inside to uh, receive the energy of the pyramid. And they wanted to cross through portals. And um, they basically believed, according to Muhammad, this was their ticket to the afterlife to explore other dimensions so um i mean you, if there was going to be one place that was I mean, yeah did i ever tell you this the uh crazy story that happened in peru in the megalithic cave when we interviewed last nope okay let me tell you that because that equates to kind of what you're where you're going with this so i think it's called napahuaca it's in the sacred valley you've been to peru right i've been to peru i haven't been to that one but that one is okay. like a it's almost like a bedrock carving, right? Well, so it's not far from Machu Picchu. It's in the Sacred Valley. You go through this remote mountainous ravine where these railroad tracks are. You hike up the side of this mountain face in the Andes. Mm -hmm. And way up in the distance, you can see this massive cave. Um, I've done a couple of videos about this. People could find and watch if they want to see what we're talking about. You get into this cave. To me, it's one of my favorite megalithic sites in the whole world if not peru because you you are in a remote area you are in a cave in the andes mountains and you get inside this cave and you see the most precision laser-like cut megalithic uh shapes in your life on one side of the cave wall it's been sheared off and there's you know basically this three-dimensional false door right and then on the other side of the cave where you kind of come in at is what looks like the sci-fi console or an altar. So when we were there in Peru, this was back in 2017, I was with Brian Forrester. He had like this Incan shaman guy that was with us who was really weirded out by the site. And like he basically said, hey, if you want to go in, I have to spray you with this incense because we can't make anything inside mad. <laughs> it's basically what he was saying. And so that was kind of freaking some people out. But we go inside this cave. After looking around for a little while, he wanted everybody just to sit down inside this cave. And this is a big cave. And this this Incan shaman guy, start, he pulls out this drum. He starts beating on the drum. And he's basically saying, just, uh, just meditate. Uh, I think he even said, welcome to spirits. And, you know, in my head at that point, I'm kind of like, whoa, be careful, people. Yeah, like um, what, you don't know what you're calling in here. Yeah. Right. And so he starts playing this drum and, and singing. And for a couple of minutes, it was just, you know, it, it did feel, I mean, just quiet and peaceful. All of a sudden, this guy in our group lets out a blood curdling scream. And, you know, to the point where like, you're just, everyone's shocked. They look up and this guy is convulsing in our group and flailing his arms and screaming. And so people rush over, you know, grabbing him. What's, are you okay? You know, like, are you having a heart attack? What's going on? And he starts to settle down and you could tell he was scared to death, like literally scared to death. And so he begins to tell his, what just happened. And he says he was meditating and I think he said he was welcoming whatever spirits. And he saw come out of that false door, that faux door. I believe he said a puma, 
or panther, I think it was a puma, that either entered him or came at him and just literally scared the life out of him. And so to me, that was such a crazy experience. It didn't happen to me, but I, you know. But you kind you witnessed somebody, it happened to somebody. Yeah. I mean, we all experienced the shock of this guy screaming and looking like he was dying. And so again, the megalithic connection between, you know, the spirit world and these megaliths seemed very real in that moment. Um, Like there was, and again, then when you learn the Inca the Inca oral traditions of the site, according to the shaman that was with us, he broke down the Inca traditions. And now this was a super sacred site to the Inca because they considered it a portal. And at a certain solstice, you know, the sun creeps over that mountain and it shines through this hole that's in that console looking piece. And then he showed how you bend down and it's like, it's perfectly crafted for someone to uh, put their head against with their arms up. And, you know, basically that's how you receive the key to then go through the door. And so pretty strange, but pretty fascinating. And again, when we're talking megaliths and spirit world, I had to share that story. It's, it, I mean, it reminds me a lot of the Amaru Muru um, in Bolivia. That's like the, the false store. The false doors are really bizarre and interesting in, in these like bedrock type um you know giant stones and uh there's like there i watched this one i've watched it a million times it's like this jerry willis guy um or jerry wills or whatever and he talks about how he like did a couple of toning some toning and then like he had the right whatever coordinates coordinates or whatever and he went through the rock door and was you know he had this whole journey or whatever and you you hear some stories about this stuff and i i don't know i it really, here's the way to, okay, in April of this year, I went to Belize and I was like on this archaeology dig and we found some shell mounds, but we didn't find anything like super um, exciting, but we did like go to some of the known, um, uh, what do you call it, like uh, me- uh, megalithic sites that were, or Mayan temple sites that were over there. It's where the crystal skull was found. What is that one called? The Lil, uh, Lil, Lilibin, L- Lubitin. Hmm. Anyway, uh, so we started, like this guy, Jared Murphy, who I went with, had this experiment that he wanted to try. He wanted to see the conductivity of the stones themselves, like in general of megalithic or like these kind of ruined type stones. So we had um, like a, a one of those meters that electricians have to measure conductivity. And, um, yeah, so you can literally touch a stone that is of the, the, the megalith or whatever of the ruins and it's super conductive. You can touch a stone on the gravel, nothing is like there's zero conductivity in like the gravel. So I was, I, it's a, it's a a little device or machine that I would like to, and I want an anal analog one. You don't want one with the battery because you don't want false readings. You want it to be completely analog. But um, I actually think it would be cool if a lot of us got these kinds of devices and started testing the stones for their conductivity properties wow. everywhere we go. Because if we could show a correlation that there is actually some sort of electric de- or that that these they are acting as antennas or they are acting as super con- conductive, there's some significance to that that could be meaning something. That's wild. And you said that was in belize Mm -hmm. that was in belize yeah south is that is that near um i think it's called the mask temple of lamani is that nearby where you were yes we did not go there but it is it was it wasn't too far from that yeah we were we were at the very we were very close to guatemala the very south okay um uh punta uh, gorda was the name of the town that we were staying in like it was near our site that we were excavating. Uh, but so we went to a lot of the sites that were um, around that and even went to some sites that aren't open to the public that don't have a name. Um, and I did a bunch of cliff stuff and like, um, well, I, I mean, I had a crazy experience. Like I had, um, I even did a, like this cave swim at this place and accidentally went into the Mayan underworld, which I didn't mean to do that. So actually talking about, this wasn't actually megalith, it was at stones, 
inside of this cave that I had to swim a mile in too, but I put my hands underneath this water ball and this thing and like I was in this, all of a sudden it was like I was in a bubble and I went down like an elevator and for just like 30 seconds I was inside of um, like a giant blue forest, like everything was blue based instead of green based. And then another guy who was with my other friend, Tyler, uh, he went in, said the same experience and he heard the word Shabala. I didn't hear that word. I just didn't hear any words. I just saw the thing. We compared notes and it was like super crazy. And then we got out and then the Mayan guy was like, this is Shambaba. This is the Mayan underworld. This is the entrance to the Mayan underworld. And we were like, Shambaba. And he's like, I was like, are you talking about Shambala? And he's like, no, Shambaba. And he was like, Shambala, Shambaba. That's not a coincidence. So anyway, I think that, I know that all sounds crazy to a bunch of people. Don't really care at this point. Nobody has to believe me. But there is some weird properties with megaliths and stones. Just saying. Wow. I mean, Nikki, you can now say, I mean, I love it. Nikki Anna Jones. I've always loved that play on, on the Indiana Absolutely. Jones. But now you, who else can say they've been to the Mayan underworld and also done archaeological excavations? I mean, like, you're you're the real deal. Come on. Oh yeah, that's well. I mean, I I, I wanted to be, but uh, you know, I I don't know. I still uh, am a flight attendant on the side, so there you go. <laughs> and you, there's so many. When I mean, when it comes to the Maya, crazy. Oh, the Maya we talk are about. another one of those. You know, I was just I um, in February I did a big Chaco Canyon and Southwest thing, and you know, you like. The Chaco people went missing, basically. When you were going to get down to it, they they were here for some time and they were gone. And then I was just listening to a Diné story, which is what the Navajo called themselves, Diné, um, online. And the guy was talking about how they were only here for 300 years and they were from they were different than us. They were a completely different people and they enslaved the Pueblo people and they had like in anyway. Mayan has a similar, like they, they were here and then they're just gone. They're just like many, I mean, there are still some Mayans that are in existence, but Incas, like a lot of these cultures that they, we don't really understand exactly what happened to them. I mean, you can say like, yeah, some disease killed them all or whatever, but there was cultures that came and gone before, with no big war thing that we know of, no big disease thing, no big colonization thing. They just were, had vast cities. And then they're abandoned overnight. And that to me is like, those are the ones you really have to look at. Because if you look at today, like whatever, it doesn't matter if you're in New York City or London or wherever, any city in the world. Like I even see it in Dallas all the time. Like there was a Pier 1 Imports there for like 10 years and they destroyed it, took it down. And now it's a bank. They built another building on top. You build on top of things like, you know, this kind of stuff happens all the time. And there's a continuity of civilization that happens. Like, you know, a lot of these, so many of these megaliths or these ruins that we go to are just like, like pump up the jam, like having a good time. And then <laughs> one day it's like done. It's like, nope, boop, buried, done, gone. And then now you can find it with mosaic tiles on the floor. It, right. It's just so kind of weird when you step back and think about that. Yeah. The Maya, I mean, I think they use some form of lost ancient technology to build their pyramids. Um, I think at the height of their culture, they had 50,000 pyramids that were active, sitting on fault lines, pushing energy up into the atmosphere. I uh, did an interview, I think last year with Cliff Dunning, and he was talking about how NASA was at Chichen Itza about 10 years ago or so. And they had a covered wall up around the El Castillo pyramid there. And they were evidently testing for, uh, energy surprise surprise and then i mean then you look at all these mayan figurines that are wearing what looks like bona fide spacesuits right or water or, or either space or like um they were going underneath the ocean like with um you know some they had some machinery on them yeah they clearly had knowledge or again even possessed fragments of lost ancient tech uh i mean it's just crazy lidar we know is uncovering more and more but they were brilliant mathematicians astronomers um and one of the most intriguing parts of maya culture to me is uh lord Bacall down there at palenque have you looked into, into him at all yeah i went to palenque and then you cannot go into Bacall's tomb but i mean like in uh right. like, like like i mean you can technically but they don't allow you but yeah the one where it, it's like 
on, on his sarcophagus it's like some stuff's coming out of his stomach and it's like a cosmic um download coming out of his gut basically um and he was a giant thank you okay that's where i was partly going with this was there is a lot of reports that this guy was minimum seven feet i've heard possibly nine feet what do you know about that yeah, I mean, I think from even what what you read in the museum, like they'll tell you that his skeleton was um, his skeleton is nine or his skeleton is, oh, it's like seven and a half feet. I mean, so who knows how tall he was when all of his, you know, uh, his ligaments were intact and uh, he was in full, you know, carnation. And it's also really weird what his queen was buried in red ochre, like her, her, when you open her, um, whatever her sarcophagus it's like there's a, a red powder over everything it's super super weird they that that i mean the the, the green mask like the jade stuff there yeah it's um palenque is a really 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 weird one but the thing i didn't even know about palenque until i was there there's so many other ruins that they don't even talk about that are just scattered all over there it's not that far from the olmec stuff and it's uh there's megalith stuff in palenque there's these giant slabs and some of them yeah. they're using as benches for people to to start uh, selling their crafts on. They're like, oh, yeah, that big stone. We don't know where that went. So let's just put it over there uh, on the <laughs> ground there and let the people show, sell their tchotchkes off of it. It's like the craziest thing to me. But, yeah, there was a lot of that going on. Or they built some new steps with the giant stones that they didn't know what else to do. Oh, man. It's yeah. Some of that really pisses me off about the. um Mayan stuff in general is the re uh construction that they've yep. done it's 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 a shame because they use a lot of mortar and mm -hmm. brick stuff and you're just kind of going why i would rather it just looked rubbly yeah just yeah. clean out all the weeds give me some rubbly stuff versus what you think it looked like based on right. whatever yeah i saw um i think it was hugh newman he's been there a bunch of times i, I interviewed him about it once he showed me or i saw one of his videos and it was exactly what you were just describing. You know, this there's this Mayan site, you know, you, you kind of have this picture of what Mayan architecture looks like. But there was massive megalithic blocks that you would see, like you might see in Peru at Palenque, which he was surmising this was the earliest uh, foundations, earliest builders here. This thing was built on top of. And so that, that was mind-blowing to me when I first saw that a couple of years ago. But yeah, Palen uh, Pakal... Another um, researcher, um, Mark something, he um, he tuned me on to when you start studying uh, Pakal, he was uh, polydactyl. He had, when you look at all of the depictions of him, it looked like he had six fingers, I believe, on one hand. Oh. Um, and then when you look into his family, I think some of them did too. Mm -hmm. Again, then you add the giant thing and what and looks like an elongated skull. And you add a lot of the rulers in South America being weird skulled because they're not all elongated skulls. Some like when yeah. I went to Colombia, like I went to this, the Musca tribe and they were like butt heads. Like <laughs> they had like big globes that I don't know how, like their heads weren't normal heads. They were just like these big bulbous skulls. So I don't know what you want to call them, but you know, uh, th they, that's another thing. It's like, we had different humans than we have today. Like, I don't know what you want to call cousins of humans or something. I don't know, but it's, it's, and when the, when the native Americans like say these, they were so different than us, you would, they were completely different from us. I don't think that means like, yeah, they just had white skin different from us. Like I'm, I'm thinking like, no, like Lovelock Cave thing, like they were giants or they were go. different like species than we were in some kind of way. And I know that sounds crazy until you start like really digging into some of this stuff and then you're kind of going, well, maybe not. But here's another thing that I think if you step back, think about pyramids, think about mounds in general, mounds. We do, they, what, whoever our ancestors or whoever these people were in the past, they did not think the way we like if to build a pyramid is not to think the way that we think now, because who builds that much structure for and has this like this much space you can live itty bitty little space, you know, like a genie's bottle or something, you know, and uh, 
like mounds. It's like, uh, why do you need that much mass? And then you right. just maybe have a little burial chamber in there, or you mm -hmm. know, I don't understand. But they didn't go in. These weren't pavilions. These weren't like civic centers where you went inside and like you know got away from the rain. Like it's ginormous false mountains. It's weird. Yeah, we don't even build that way or think to build that way. Yeah. I know you follow uh, Dr. Gregory Little on Twitter too. Yeah, I've had him on my thing too. He's so cool. And I love his mound book. It's like the pivotal, like everybody, if you don't understand what's going on with mounds, you need to get Gregory's book. It's like really, really expensive, but like really worth it. You need it yeah. because it's amazing. No, I've, I, 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 let's just say I'm saving up for that book. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, yeah, I interviewed him too. Fascinating. And the pictures he posts on Twitter, you guys need to follow him on Twitter, Dr. Gregory Little, or it's Greg Little. Yeah, uh, every day he posts like a new amount and just the amount is insane. And what got me was the pictures he's posting of the artifacts found inside, you know, because we've kind of all heard about mounds now, or at least those of us in this space. But he's the only one I know that's consistently posting the artifacts found inside. Some of these artifacts in the Ohio mounds looks just like a Mayan artifact. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it is incredible. So there's a connection right there. Yeah, it's cra like crazy pottery, crazy patterning. A lot of that V thing on the eye, which I had uh, this John Ford guy on who thinks like that's like like almost like the Mayan version of the pineal gland or like the raw eye kind of thing. You know, it looks like it looks like this on a lot of the eyes on the pottery sculptures. There, there was a... Um, when you start looking at mound culture artifacts in general, there is a continuity to a, it's it, it's a civilization that goes together, which doesn't it, it's not like that's super surprising or anything. But I mean, the picture that we always get of Native Americans from, you know, public school is that um, which is I, it's a little bit different because like I grew up um, I grew up next to the Isleta Pueblo. I went to school with um, the Pueblo. Uh, so I went to elementary school with um uh like we'd have like a talk from the native or the elders like on, the, on every friday they would come in and tell us their stories because like we they mixed our classes and stuff so so that so i guess i have a kind of unique upbringing like that but they even within that it's like they only want to talk about their pueblo like you know and the difference between a pueblo and a reservation is a pueblo is in their original land that they were part of like they didn't get like they didn't get moved and repurposed someplace else that they weren't um that that wasn't their home so that's like the that's why actually some of the new mexican pueblos like like the zuni and the hopi or or like a lot of the navajo nation and stuff is really important because they were never moved from the land that they were like from so there is a lot of um uh history that hasn't been lost from their oral traditions okay so but i digress anyway like the picture that you get, like if you watch any Western show, is that there's a bunch of different, like, oh, I'm a Sioux and I'm a Cherokee and we live here and then we fight each other. We're in all these wars and we live in teepees and we kill each other and we move on to wherever we get Buffalo. And then like, and we're not, and we're just like tent people later. Like their Cahokia, which I just went to in May, oh, wow. it's like, was bigger than New York City. It was like the Las yeah. Vegas or the, the New York City. I mean, we're talking about the Monk's Mound is got the same like diameter base square footage as like right. the pyramid it's insane how big some of these things are this is not a like all right you guys we're just gonna go build some tents and have some fun and later on i mean yeah they, it, they were way more sophisticated than we're talking about and we destroyed a million mounds that we know of like, I don't know what, well, I don't know why you would go, why not just build on that hill? Like, I don't know why you want to go ahead and just destroy it. But there's right. tons of pictures of, of, uh, from in the 1800s where they are completely deconstructing them. Why? I don't know. It's weird. Yeah. Isn't, um, Cahokia, I don't know if it's Monk's Mound, but in one of those, uh, Dr. Little was talking about how there's still a, an inner structure inside of it. Oh yeah, um, and the Monk's Mount itself, like they haven't actually excavated the whole thing. That's crazy. Giants, by the way, found to the right of um of uh Cahokia Mount, like seven foot, like tons of um, I can't remember how many, mm. but that's actually in the archaeology um with our footnotes or whatever of the site, the site notes. Um there there's like seven foot tall 
giants found there too. And the percentage of, and okay, yes, seven foot people, the percentage of giants that are found in North America, like in some of this stuff is way more than, you know, you would naturally get occurring in our society. Yeah. And Greg Little, he said that he believed from all of the book he's written, all the research he's done, you know, all the old Smithsonian publications alone that he read, the old Smithsonian publications themselves before political correctness really seeped in, they talk about giants. They talk about this ruling class. And so uh, Dr. Little believes that the ruling class in North America at that time uh, who were buried in these mounds were I think you would call them Denisovans. Um, some people would call them, well, those are really Nephilim. Whatever you believe, they do seem to be some kind of hybrid that um, was at least seven foot tall, usually seven to nine foot. And again, often polydactyl. And um, there's reports of some of these having double rows of, of teeth. Um, and then just crazy weapons they had and armor. Have you heard about the giants even found on Catalina Island? Yeah, I have. Like, and, and a lot of, uh, and uh, uh, weird skulls. Exactly. Not just long, big uh, skeletons, but el an elongated skull like you would see in Peru and Paracas. And so, I mean, to me, that's pretty fascinating. Right there off the coast of California. Obviously, there's Serpent Mound, um, mm -hmm. which... The structure itself is incredible, but um, there was, I believe, an eight-foot giant skeleton found there. Um, so giants all over. We've talked about, I think we talked about Lovelock on our last story, right? Yeah, we did talk about, like, we talked about Lovelock on our last thing, our last thing and, like, I really liked that you actually got to see some of the, the skulls at that little museum, right? I actually didn't see them. Um, I went to the cave, though. And I was just pulling from pictures and reports of other people who have gone to that museum. But so fascinating. I know I could talk all day, but we probably got to wrap this up. Yeah, we got to wrap it up. Okay, so just what, what you know, this is just amazing stuff. Okay, so tell tell people about your where they can find you and yeah. what you're doing. You He's got a Egypt tour and a Peru tour coming up. And... Derek, Derek's like a good person to go to it with all this stuff. So tell us like where they, what yeah. tells everything. Yeah. You can find, um, kind of my blog, uh, at megalithicmarvels.com, uh, slash tours is where you can find the tours. We got a Peru tour this October. Um, and then I think it's second through the 12th. It's going to be incredible. We're going to see, you know, all the big major sites, Machu Picchu, Ojante Tambo and the stuff around Cusco. But then we're going to, really do some exploring and find all these hidden gem megalithic sites that have been on my bucket list. Are uh, you going with like Brian Forrester? Or are you doing like a different like tour group kind of thing? Or Yeah. Like I, this is just, just my own. I found a, I found a really cool um, tour company down there. That's really able to customize anything I want. And I, I, I asked them flat up up front, like, Hey, I'm, I'm into alternative history. I don't bind the the mainstream narrative of a lot like of things. The story of, yeah. So are you okay with the partnering with somebody like me? And they were like, absolutely. Um, I said, cool. As long as you're okay with that, we could have probably a great tour. So it's been, they've been awesome to work with. Um, so yeah, that's this October. People can use, um, if you, if you go to that, megalithicmarvels.com slash tours there's a code you can use to get 200 off and then yeah this may again going back to egypt with muhammad ibrahim and we got a discount code you can use now still for that for a limited time um but going with him is awesome because again he's an egyptologist he grew up in the shadow of the pyramids he's got a lifetime of connections so he can really get us into some exclusive uh, private tours that i don't think your average group gets um, so people, we'd love for you to join us on that. But other than that, um, yeah, I'm just trying to keep up with all the spinning plates, right. Of right, creating right. You content. Know, like, like, he posts like amazing videos and pictures from just yourself and other people who, like, I mean, basically Derek has his eye on the, what do you always say? The anomalous, awesome 
stuff that you need to like yeah. be focusing on and he post, post what every day do you post something or every couple days or something oh yeah every i try to post something at least every day but yeah you can follow me on uh, instagram youtube um i'm on facebook uh twitter as well and yeah i don't just post my own content but um i try to feature other people's great content you mentioned um our buddy from wandering wolf i posted um Boy, it was several months ago now. So one of his clips of the sage wall, I think it was in Montana. Yeah. Yeah. And that got a lot of traction. That was cool. He's and got a lot of cool stuff. You should look at his show. Um, yeah. he, he's did the long view caves and the, you know, okay. Yongshu, Corey. like he went to China. Like he's, he's done yeah. a lot of places that are really hard to get to that he's actually gone to. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then w from this interview, I'll, I'll try to create some shorts too and uh, reels and that'll be fun. Cool. All right, Derek, well, I loved having you on and we will for sure be talking again at some point. Thanks, Nikki.